you. All right, welcome folks who have just joined. We're gonna wait a few minutes to, to get settled and let folks kind of jump off their last call to jump onto this one. So we'll start a couple minutes after the hour. All right, a lot of folks piling in now. So we got folks from all over the world today. So good morning, good evening, good afternoon from where you are. We'll get started in a couple minutes here, just waiting for everybody to pile in and um, get settled here. So we got a good group today. All right, well, we can go ahead and get started since we do have a lot to cover today and really excited to, to, to get into the discussion. I wanna make sure we have a lot of time for that part. So what I will do is quickly, if everybody can see my screen, which I think you can, is kick off, kick off by introducing myself. I'll talk about the PSC really quickly for folks that are new to the PSC or the Pre-Sales Collective, and then we'll quickly give an overview of the topic and then we'll jump right into discussion. So with that, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Yuji Higashi, I currently lead the pre-sales solution consulting team at Outreach. I'm also co-founder of the Pre-Sales Collective. And then for those of you who are, are new to the Pre-Sales Collective, I'll quickly explain what we're about. Our mission is to bring pre-sales folks together from around the globe to learn, to network, to develop professionally. And this community is meant for anyone who is in a pre-sales role, but also for those who are interested in the profession, folks that might, might wanna, you wanna get into the role. Um, like many of us, I landed in a pre-sales role accidentally, but now that I'm here, I love it and plan to be in this role for the rest of my career. And so that's what we're, you know, that's why we built this and that's why I'm excited about what we're doing to help elevate this function and also highlight some of the amazing things that pre-sales folks are doing, just like folks will have on the panel today and a lot of you in the audience. So before we get into the topic and introduce the panel, let's uh, let's see who we have in, on the, uh, in the audience today with a quick poll. So what, what best describes your role? Are you an SC? Are you in pre-sales? Are you on the sales side of the house? Some of our sales partners or maybe other, maybe you're looking to get in the role today. All right, so mostly pre-sales and then, and then a handful of others. Good to see, good to see. All right, cool. Well, Let's see, with that, let's jump into the topic. I wanna to quickly introduce the topic that we have today. If I can get this Zoom pull out of the way here. Cool. So we have an incredible panel with us today who will share insight and into how to drive better business results through diversity and inclusion. Each of the panelists will have different stories, experiences, and, and perspectives to share with you. What, you, what we expect to, uh, for you to get out of today's session is, is insight and perspective on the importance of having a diverse pre-sales team. And our panel of pre-sales leaders will share their thoughts and ideas on how you can foster a diverse and inclusive environment within your own pre-sales team and also across our community at large. And to set the stage, I'd like to quickly share a couple findings from a recent McKinsey study. Uh, the first of which is companies in the top quartile for racial and ethnic diversity are 35% more likely to have financial returns above their respective national industry medians. And on the same token, companies in the top quartile for gender diversity are 15% more likely to have returns above national averages, right? And so what that tells us is that companies who are highly diverse have results that 
are much higher than those who are not, right? And so with that, this is quickly just to set the stage. And with that, I really want to go ahead and introduce our panel. So, oops, let me stop the share here so we can see everybody's face. And with that, maybe we'll start with Christina. If you can give us your role, where you're based, how long you've been in pre-sales, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, of course. First of all, thanks uh, to both you, Eugene James, for uh, setting this up. It's amazing that you're doing this. It's the first time I've ever seen uh, pre-sales collective um, being represented uh, globally. So thank you for doing this. Uh, just quick intro on myself, Christina Weir. I lead the pre-sales team at Sprinkler globally. Sprinkler is an enterprise management um, uh, SaaS software that really focuses on social media. And I'm actually based in San Francisco, though I've got a team of solution consultants, solution architects, and he's an even specialist on the team. And as far as how long have I been in pre-sales, I was fortunate enough to stumble into this role early on to my career. So I've been in pre-sales as an individual contributor or in a leadership capacity for a little over 25 years. I started when I was 12, 12 years old. Thanks for having me. Wow. Well, it's great to have you on. Thanks, Christina. Carl, how about you from way down under? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, my name is Carl Lewis. Uh, I'm a lead solution architect for Geo Security, a uh, Cisco company. Uh, I'm actually based out of Melbourne. So right now I just had my first coffee. It's super early. <laughs> um, but either way, I'm, I'm super, happy, super happy to be here as well. Uh, my background, as most people, I didn't start off. I didn't go to school to become an SE, but I started off with network architecture and found a passion for really just talking to customers and whiteboarding, honestly, and uh, that's what led me to pre-sales. Cool. Thanks, Carl. Great to have you. Marjorie, how about you? Good day, everyone. Um, thanks, James and Yuji. Again, similar to what Christina said, super excited to be here with all of you and with the great panel here um, to talk about such an important topic. Um, as as you mentioned, my name is Marjorie Abdel Cream, and I'm based in the great state of New Jersey, and um, currently work for VMware, where we do cloud computing and virtualization. Uh, I lead the Americas VMC on a so our VMware Cloud on AWS solution here for the Americas team. And I've been in um, in an SE function since um, 2008, and I like to say that I came in kicking and screaming, but like you, UG, I'm not leaving. So. <laughs> It's been a ton of fun and I've truly enjoyed it. Awesome. Thanks, Marjorie. Great to have you as well. And last but certainly not least, Rohan. Hey, guys. Uh, good to be here. My name is Rohan Vaidya. I lead the sales engineering team at gong.io. We actually just started the sales engineering team about three months ago. Uh, before that, I was at Zora for about seven years in both an individual contributor plus leadership positions over there. And, and past, in my past life, I've been at Jive Software, Oracle, Siebel Systems, if you remember that CRM system back in the day as well. I've kind of progressed from software engineering to post-sales to now pre-sales and have made my career in pre-sales for the past about 10 years. I'm based in San Francisco and I'm, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Thanks for having me. Great. Thanks, Rohan. All right. Well, let's get into the first question, which is a little bit of a softball to get things warmed up here. More of an ice icebreaker question. We'll start with what was your first job ever? And maybe sales job if you have one, but, but uh, let's start with you again, Christina. Uh, I think I might've been a little bit of a trouble troublemaker as a youth uh, because I was busy. I had a lot of free time in the summer. Um, so my actual first job, my, my parents wanted to get me out of too much free time this summer. So it was actually working at Oracle in the finance team. It was an amazing way to walk into technology. All right. You started early, huh? And, and what about uh, Carl? Uh, yeah, job? so I think, uh, yeah, so I think everyone uh, should find something they're passionate about when they, when they do a job. And for me, uh, when I was 12 years old, uh, Pokemon was something I was super passionate about. So my first job was being kind of a Pokemon card salesman. Uh, it was actually a very lucrative business. I actually expanded from my own school to a, another school. And my mom used to actually help me with spreadsheets to figure out what the cost and all that stuff was. So it was actually really fun. Wow, that's incredible. A legitimate Pokemon business. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> all right. What about you, Marjorie? 
Yeah, so I, I like to think of this question more about um, the, the exposure that all of us have to sales and how we don't always think of everything that we do as selling. And, um, you know, I've been asked this question a lot lately. I've been rethinking it. And the story that I like to share is for, from back when I was like in second grade. And, you know, picture this, I lived in Jersey City back, back in the day before it was cool to live in Jersey City. And our school had the, you know, the old school sharpener that you'd go up to the teacher's desk and sharpen your pencil. It was broken, it wasn't fixed for a while. And my mom had finally given me a sharpener. So I'd go to school and I'd be the only one with an actual sharpener to be able to <laughs> sharpen my pencil. Well, the kids realized and they'd come over and ask me to sharpen their pencils. So I, I um, you know, at the time I obviously didn't get much pocket money. So I figured I've got to make a business out of it. You got to figure out how to make some money. So I would charge the kids five cents to sharpen. Um, so they would come over, I'd charge them, you know, they're the nickel and they'd be able to sharpen their pencils, great. I'm here super excited that I'm making some money. My mom found out, got furious <laughs> and said we should be sharing. Um, but I was telling the story to someone and they said that's actually sharpening as a service. So if you think about it, I was doing as a service well before it was cool to do as a service. That's fantastic. Love that. Sharpeners as a service, love it. All right. What about you, Rohan? What was your first job ever? Um, my first job, my first paying job was actually umpiring Little League when I was in middle school. So I was maybe 13 or 14, maybe about 12 or 13, about 13 or 14. And I just moved to the U.S. a couple of years earlier. So it's not like I had a whole lot of background in baseball. I think one of those years that I'd watched baseball was the strike year of 94 as well. So I felt like after one year of watching baseball on TV, I could go and umpire Little League. And I went and did that because I was getting paid 10 bucks per game and I could go buy comic books with that money. But I figured you know, it can't be that different than cricket. You just, when you hit the ball over the fence, you get one run instead of six runs. So I apologize to any of the parents out there that I might have made bad calls for, but I think they were okay in the end. Cool. Yeah, that's that's a great, great summer job. Yeah, it looks like we have quite a diverse range of, of uh, first jobs from this group, right? Starting at Oracle, starting at uh, selling Pokemon cards, sharpers of service, and umpiring. What a range. All right. Now, before we get into the diversity inclusion specific questions, I do want to start or trigger one more poll here just to ask the audience, with regard to diversity inclusion, I consider or you consider yourself to be a novice, capable, competent, proficient expert. And it's not a, it's not meant to be a, a, a brain buster here, but more just want to get a sense for kind of where you are. I probably consider myself to be more on the capable to competent area. Definitely a lot for me to learn. So let's see what we uh, get from the group here. Got 63, 65, 70% responses so far. So good. This looks very much like a standard bell curve. Looks like most of the people are ending up on, co on competent here. I'll go ahead and share the results just so everybody can see them. Yeah, it looks like a pretty standard bell curve. So we got some experts in, on the on the audience. So that's always good to see. All right, with that, let's launch into the second question here, or the I guess first real question here, which is, why is diversity in the workplace important to you? And in what ways do you think diversity is important for pre-sales teams specifically? Christina, you want to kick us off again with this response? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because um, I, I, just in, in my past and in my current role, um, I'm a firm believer of diversity of thought, right? And what fuels diversity of thought is really diverse backgrounds. I mean, if you think about uh, the different ideas or even, even just on this call, the different individuals that we have on this call bring so much, uh, so many ideas uh, to the forefront. So just the whole idea of having diversity in a company or in an organization brings new ideas, new innovations, even new strategies to the organization. So with diversity, I truly believe diversity fuels diversity of thought. And what that then does to an organization or a company is it provides a competitive edge because we're coming up with all these different ideas on how to uh, drive better pre-sales, how to drive a better organization. Um, and all of that all ties in to actually the numbers that you shared earlier on um, what diversity brings to the organization. Good, I like that. Yeah, diversity certainly can provide a competitive edge and that's exactly right, w was shown in that McKinsey study. 
Thanks, Christina. What about Carl? What are your thoughts on on diversity in the workplace and why it's important? Yeah, I, yourself I, as well. Yeah, for sure. I think diversity in the workplace is important to me specifically because as someone growing up, I, I kind of put on my shoulders to, to kind of go against the grain and be someone that doesn't live up to a certain stereotype. And having diversity in a workplace really resets your own maybe natural biases you have towards people. So it really opens you up to experiencing new things as well as being able to just communicate with people because work kind of brings together so many different types of personalities and, and backgrounds. So you're kind of forced and uh, pushed into expanding yourself as a person. And when it comes to pre-sales specifically, I think the biggest thing is growth and the ability to listen and communicate. Because when you're engaging with somebody that's different than you, or maybe uh, you know, it's just someone that you're you're not used to communicating with, you're forced to kind of ask those questions, and and that really translates well to a pre-sales role where your job is really to listen and listen to customers, right? So I think that's that's a valuable skill. It's a great point, Carl. Marjorie, what about your thoughts? Yeah, so so I, I love um, what Christina said, right? The, the aspect of bringing kind of the strengths of different team members into an organization. And I think that's important for any team, right? Not just a pre-sales team. We look at the skill set required for an SE. It's it's a very diverse skill set to begin with. It's not something that you uniquely find. You can't uniquely find it in every single individual. People have to learn different things. So when you have individuals on a team that have different perspectives, different experiences, and different ways of thinking, you now challenge the entire team to focus on what are some of the weaknesses and how can you shore them up to build strengths and then allow you to have a better way to communicate with your customer, right? You're, you need to be able to be empathetic and understand where your customer is coming from, and you're not always going to have those experiences at a personal level. So learning from a diverse set of folks, is just, it's super important to be able to build that skill set within a team. It is. It is. I absolutely agree with that. Thanks for sharing, Mar Marjorie. Rohan, what are your thoughts on this top on this question? Yeah, I, I think just taking Marjorie, what you said one step further, it's it, if you have diversity of thought, if you have diverse backgrounds, you can problem solve with customers really well. I think the other side of that is also internally. Oftentimes when you have internal challenges or internal projects that are needed, if you have a diverse and creative team, you can solve those internal challenges in a much better fashion as well. Like how do you want to tackle in the pre-sales role? How do you want to tackle a particularly difficult sales segment? Or how do we want to objection handle this objection that we get all the time um, about our product or about our security of our product or even about why we're needed as a, as a product or as a service itself? Or how do we combat this, this competitor? Let's say there's all these little things that we have to work on as a sales engineering team and if you have diversity of thought, it helps you solve those internal challenges as well, not just those external ones. Yeah, well, that's a good point. I mean, there's as SCs, we're always trying to solve problems, and that's a key part of our role. And so, being too rigid in your thinking, right, is is or or having not having diverse perspectives on a team um, can be a hindrance potentially. So, thanks, guys, for that those responses. Uh, let's move on to our next question here. So, the next question, if I can queue it up here. For the managers, when you set out to hire candidates who align with your culture, how do you avoid disqualifying people with different backgrounds? And maybe we'll start with Marjorie on this one, go to Rohan, and then Christina can wrap us up. Yeah, so, um, you know, when, when we were first talking about this question, I know I personally was a little conflicted with how I would come to the table with a response to this one, um, because it it immediately makes you think of what am I doing to exclude people and how do I make sure that I'm not excluding individuals from a process um, by biases that I might have. So I think one of the things that we need to make sure is that as, a, as, a, as leaders and as individuals that we have that are part of the interview process, they're very clear on what exactly are the uh, def defined requirements for the role. So you should have a clear rubric of what exactly you're looking for, you have a consistent process for your interview. So if you're gonna be asking questions, the same questions should be asked of every single individual. And actually what I've done lately is I actually share those questions in advance so that individuals aren't in, put in a gotcha situation where they are feeling like they're either being attacked or put on the defense. And you wanna make sure that everyone is able to fully think through every single question because you don't, you don't know if certain individuals 
might feel pressure in a different manner when they're, you know, if they're in a panel with five or six people, right? People react differently to different situations and different stress levels. So it's super important that you give folks an equal playing field, um, you are clear with what your requirements are, and that you're consistent with how you're actually scoring folks, and that you're not scoring folks based on a perceived notion that you might have about a certain class or group of folks, and are clear, again, from the beginning with the entire folks that are part of the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's similar to what I think about this. What what comes to mind for me is biases. So much what you said, Marjorie. And it's just there all there's all these biases out there that exist that we all have as people, whether we realize them or not, subconscious or not. And as hiring managers, I feel like there is a responsibility we have to learn what the common biases are that come up during the hiring process. Introspect to figure out which ones we personally might fall prey to out of those common biases and then be especially conscious of those biases when you're actually in your interview process. So when you're looking at a resume or when you have a phone interview or if you have an in-person interview, if we ever do those again, um, you're just conscious of those biases there. And there's a few main ones that pop up all the time during hiring that I feel like we should keep in mind that I I try to keep in mind myself. There's a lot of resources out there on biases in general that list them all, but the three that I think about all the time are um, the affinity bias, where you tend to be drawn towards people either that are like you or that are like the rest of your team. Um, and again, if you, if you fall into that bias, then you essentially just end up hiring more and more people just like you, more and more people that are just like your team and just becomes a very uniform team. And then you lose that diversity of thought. You lose, lose that diverse background that we've been talking about over there. So there's that affinity bias to keep in mind. There's the maternal bias, which I think is pretty self-explanatory and pretty stupid in mind. There's a bias against women that, that are mothers. It makes you think that they can't do the same job or they won't have the time to do the same job as well, which is obviously ridiculous. But Again, it's subconscious. You're not consciously thinking about it, but when you see someone like that, you might think, hey, you know, maybe I'll think, I'll rethink this. And the third bias that comes up all the time that we have to be aware of is the, the performance attribution bias, which is the, a tendency to favor people just because you perceive them as naturally talented or that they just get it without anything solid behind it that gut feeling that you have that might influence your, your reasoning sometimes is a bias. And again, I think it's, it's important to just be careful but not relying on your gut too much because you might just be subconsciously propagating some of your biases that, that you have. Gut feelings are great in some scenarios and they are great in hiring as well, but just be conscious that you might have a gut feeling on someone and that might be because you have a bias on someone. So again, just long-winded way of saying that there's these biases that exist out there. Let's be conscious of them. Let's figure out what we're doing for those biases so that when we are talking to a customer, talking to a candidate, we know exactly what we should not be doing and what we should not fall prey to. Okay. I like that a lot. Christina, anything to add? You know, I, I so first of all, I agree 100% with the comments that Marjorie and the, the, the guidance that Marjorie had provided consistency is key and crucial to that and having uh you know specific spe specific data or things that you're looking for in the interview process absolutely 100 percent um i like i think that's so crucial um what rohan was talking about about the unconscious biases you know the first thing we have to do is we we do we have to check ourselves and just be aware that that exists everyone has unconscious biases, whether we like it or not. And so just, you know, incorporating that and knowing that into the process, uh, I think both of those need to be part of the interview, interview process. And then the, the only thing I would add to that are probably two other things that I've, um, I've thought of in this process. And one was I found out that uh, there are things that, uh, that they, a person may want to ask that they may not feel comfortable asking. And so I often start interview processes with giving the candidate an opportunity to ask me or ask anyone a question that they have. Because we're, you know, we often in interview process are assessing, are they good enough for, for the company? But I, I actually flip it initially to say, well, are we good enough for you? 
as a candidate and ensure that that candidate has the ability to ask any questions um, through the interview process. It actually maybe it might throw some people off, but it's really, for me, it gives me an opportunity to just think, well, they must have things that are front of mind. I had one time I had um, an SC candidate um, who wanted to ask me about, uh, you know, whether this company is, is friendly to raising children because at some point she wants to, uh, you know, she's married, she doesn't have any kids, uh, and she wanted to understand what it's like. And so I, I was very honest with her and gave her a perspective uh, based on what I think, what I've seen in the organization and how we support that. Um, and, she, you know, it was, it was fantastic. I mean, she, um, you know, she, she was really appreciative of that. So I think that's one is try to have the candidates not disqualify um, us initially and really give them, give them an opportunity also to ask any questions. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good point, Christina. I think, you know, even, you know, being a little vulnerable here, I've, I, not too recently, but uh, lost a, a incredible female candidate who had, had gone through our entire process. And I thought, you know, we offered her and I thought uh, I was going to get her on the team and she was going to accept. And she came back and said, look, you didn't have any females on our interview loop. And of course, normally I try to do that. But in this in this one loop, we were trying to scramble to get the right people on. And it was really that reason why I, um, you know, didn't get this incredible candidate on the team. So big lesson learned for me there. Um, but, but I think that's a great call out for, for folks that, you know, who are hiring or will be hiring, you know, as, as they become managers. Thanks, Christina. All right, we'll move on to the next question here. Uh, and this is probably for Carl. Uh, what, what could or what does or could leadership do to better support you in creating an inclusive culture? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, something that I think is, is first and foremost with that one is being intentional. Um, just from hearing from the leaders right now, like there's, there's a lot of purpose behind taking diversity seriously. And I think calling that out immediately, for instance, what Christina mentioned in the interview, opening up that ability to have a conversation around things that maybe I feel uncomfortable about, or maybe I just want to know about the organization. Uh, so calling that out immediately and preferably during the interview would be great because it also gives you a chance to, to gauge if this is going to be a good fit for you as a, as a candidate, right? So I think one of the best questions I was asked um, was, you know, hey, if we brought you into a team where 10 people are a part of that team and nine of them are the same and you're different, how would you feel about that? And at the time, I thought it was kind of a challenger type question, like, why, why are you asking me that? But it, it made me think to where, like, what, what do I bring to the team and how am I different? And it also opened my eyes to saying, hey, they're open to bringing people that are different. And I think that's, that's something that um, is, is super important um, just as someone that, that comes into an organization. That's, that's great. I actually <laughs> took note of that because I do want to use that for my interview loops as well. All right, let's move on to the next question here. Thanks for that, Carl. So what are examples of how diversity of thought has contributed to business outcomes? This is tying back to, to our, our topic and some of the, the results from the Kinsey study. Uh, Carl, you want to start us off here as well? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I had a, a real life, because uh, right now I'm currently actually on an international assignment. Uh, and I ended up going to a customer and uh, it was a very important deal. Uh, I'll say there's a lot of eyes on it. And I walked into this customer meeting and the leader actually said, I just want to set the tone. I do not want someone coming from the Bay Area uh, to tell me how to do my business. I'm in Singapore. I want to make sure you understand how business is done in Singapore. Uh, and that actually opened my eyes quite a bit because I think our intention was to go in there and educate the customer as well as listen to them, right? But it made me think that, you know, hey, we have a team here um, that, that knows Singapore, that knows their culture, that knows what it, what it, what it means to communicate to, to these leaders. Don't go in there, you know, and assume that you know everything. So it, it opened my eyes to, to starting to lean more on that team and that yielded and they built that relationship and actually had us sidestep a, a lot of potential issues in that conversation just because they knew the culture. And it just, it was, it was a great eye-opening experience for me to come from a customer, not just from a leader or a teammate, but a customer actually saying that. And uh, that having the, the team there to support me and 
teach me and coach me on what's best here was, was a great experience personally, but then also yielded us winning the deal. So it was, it was, a, it was a great experience for me. Yeah, I think you have, definitely have to very, very much be open minded, right? Especially when you're working global. And, and, you know, this, this uh, business is getting much more global and you're all, we're always working with folks from around the world. So it's, it's, it's important to always understand how other people go about their business or, or live their lives. So that's a great call out. Thanks, Carl. Uh, Marjorie, what are your thoughts? Do you have an example of, of how diversity of thoughts contributed to business outcomes? Yeah, yeah. So um, I have a, a pretty interesting story. So I used to manage the Western um, sales organization for a different company. And um, part of it was the Midwest. So the West is fairly large, right? So um, I'd always like to go out and customer visits. And I, I had asked for one of my team members to schedule some meetings because I wanted to spend some time with him and, and his customers. And um, and this was out in the Midwest, right? Um, so he sends me a note and he's like, hey, Marjorie, can you, um, you send me a picture of yourself? And I didn't know what to make of the question. And I was like, um, not really sure where you're going with this, but sure, I'll send you a picture. Can you help me understand why? And he's like, well, I don't want you to walk into this meeting and be a distraction. Um, so I, I, you know, was caught off guard by the comment initially and I thought, you know, okay, well, let's, let's break this down a little bit. Let's talk a little bit more about what, what the concern is. And he's like, well, there aren't many people like you that come into this area and, you know, you might shift the conversation from where we want it to go. So I said, how about we set up a lunch with this customer beforehand and, you know, let's spend some time getting to know him so that um, he doesn't feel uncomfortable with me in the meeting. And no joke, I landed um, at the airport in this uh, city and it was kind of like that movie style where you're walking down the terminal and literally people would stop talking as you're walking past by them. It's just very odd. So anyway, so I, I got kind of the gist of why he had asked for the photo. So we meet with the customer, um, great conversation. And I, I opened it up by saying, hey, you know, if you have any questions that are not work related, I'm more than happy to answer them. And um, he was, you know, he asked a lot of questions. He was conservative Christian, wanted to understand a little bit more about my faith. And this was right around, you know, 2009 timeframe. So there was a lot going on in the world. And um, I felt like afterwards we connected really well and he kept that relationship and we were able to continue to build better business with him because I was willing to have that open and honest conversation with him about who I am. And I think that's extremely important that when we talk about diversity, I know a lot of times we say we, we shouldn't put the burden on the individuals, but as leaders, we should carry that burden if we are um, folks of different backgrounds, right? If I come from a different background, I think it's important that I represent uh, women, that I represent Latinos, that I represent um, Muslims, because if I don't, who will? And um, if I don't change that perception of what I bring to the table and what people like me can bring to the table, no one will, right? So I think that's, you know, it's a dual win for me, right? A win for, for me to make sure that I'm representing my background in a positive light and also for the customer to feel like it's okay to have that type of conversation and build a tighter relationship with us as a, as a company. Marjorie, I literally have goosebumps from this story. It's fan it's a fantastic story and really like amazing on you as a leader to, because it's easy to take that and, and get almost, I don't want to say defensive, but just have a different perspective. But rather than, um, than having this defensive mechanism, it's more, it, it sounds like you came from um, a point of, well, let me just make sure um, I understand and that there's no ill intent. Right. If we all start with, there's no ill intent, but let's just come from an understanding. It, yeah. It's even brokered a, a an amazing relationship. It sounds like. So I just wanted to like kudos to you. And I think yeah, we take really some good. of that stuff. Sorry, Eugene, and just no, we take ahead. some of that stuff for for granted as well. Just because I, I live in San Francisco, it's a pretty diverse city. A lot of us live in cosmopolitan cities all over the world. So we take some of these things for granted. And when we do travel to other regions that have different points of view, then we do have to be conscious of, hey, it might be, it might be a different work environment out there. It might be a different cultural environment out there. Carl, you're in, you're in Asia right now. So just all over the world that wherever you are working, we just have to be conscious of what the environment is out there and how we might be perceived out there as well. It's a great point, Rohan, and, and thanks for the story, Marjorie. I think that's so spot on. And, you know, just being open-minded and being willing to kind of share 
your background, share your story, and that will allow others to, to, to feel like they can do the same and, and also have a better understanding for where we're coming from. I, I think that's, that's really powerful. All right, let's move on to the next question here, which is a little bit of potentially concert controversial one, but I'd love to get your guys' perspectives on, on the use of policies or mandates or even comp structures to enforce diversity on teams. We've heard of some companies like Salesforce having a you know thirty percent requirement for for having uh, or women. Um, we, we've or we've heard of other companies doing something similar. So I'd love to get your guys' perspective on on this question. Christina, maybe we'll start with you. Oh, I know we had a really good conversation <laughs> on this, and I and perhaps I, I come a little bit from a more controversial background. And in full disclosure, I worked at Salesforce for six years before I joined Sprinkler. Uh, and and I've also I've seen I've seen one side of the, the good in in applying either mandates and po and policy numbers uh, where it really has helped um, um, organizations and companies. I've also seen perhaps the flip side. I mean, my my husband he's he's a Canadian Caucasian, and I've seen him be passed up for multiple jobs because he didn't fit the mold. The, the the metrics or the policies uh, at the time at the company that he worked for. And so for me, I, I think what what I would um, suggest and I think what's really important is ensure one that there are there are guidelines and these guidelines are something that is always reviewed at the executive leadership team. It can't be just regionally based because I think within the pre-sales organization, I mean, personally, I have over 50% of my um, SE leaders are women. I have um, over 40% that are uh, in pre-sales that are women. And we, we are also ensuring that there's diversity, different backgrounds, locations, things like that. Um, but the, the things that I would recommend, I think that's really important, is ensure that the executive leadership team and the senior leadership team continue to evaluate this on a quarterly and annual basis. And actually look at the deltas. Are we increasing? Are we decreasing? We need to keep it front of mind, starting at the executive level. And then a lot of that trickles to the all the different organizations. That's one. And really the second thing that I do believe in mandating uh, and is this whole idea of mandating that during the, the interview process, especially the panels, whether you want to hire this person or not, that's the other kind of big thing. Whether you as a hiring manager believe it or not, ensure that that person speaks with um, or is able to interview with someone with their similar background. Um, in, in the case of women, I make sure that there's always, an, there's always a female in the interview process. Um, whether we decide to bring that person on board or not, that person's going to have an opportunity to speak with another female. So those are kind of the two suggestions I have. That's great. Thanks, Christina. Marjorie, what are your what are your thoughts or perspectives on this? Yeah, yeah. And and I loved um, I loved your commentary, Christina. I think um, it it is a it's a tough topic, right? And it's one that um, you know, I, I when we had this conversation um, earlier, you know, as we were going through the prep, um, I gotta say, Christina really made me reflect, right? And think about what exactly it is that we're trying to accomplish, um, you know, in, in the world today. And, and Rohan also had some great points. And, and I feel like um, when we talk about this, we need to be conscious about the whole and not about the group, right? And, and I do still, I'm still a big believer in implementing policies that mandate some type of change within an organization. And I, I've seen how it can actually drive change, but I feel that sometimes these mandates miss the bigger picture and the communication and approach and how we actually try to implement them, they're, they miss that, that by a whole, you know, I mean, I can't even talk about the stretch of length that we miss it. We, we don't invite all employees to be part of the conversation, part of the solution. We focus on top tier levels, which is not the right approach. I think this needs to be, everyone needs to be part of this conversation. How do we solve this as a team? And there's interesting research about how, you know, if you position it to a group of majority individuals, how do they feel? when you talk to them about policies versus when you're talking to a minority group and there's, you know, the, the converse as well. So I think there's, there's competing research on both sides. I still do think that everyone needs to be part of the conversation. You also need to work on increasing transparency. If you are going to implement any type of mandate, you need to be clear. This is why we're doing it. And here's the reason, how, this is the reason why, and this is how we're going to implement it so that folks don't feel like they're being sidelined or being overlooked or that they're being put at a disadvantage in any manner, right? So th that's another component. 
And finally, I think there needs to be, you know, clear documentation on accountability at all levels. And obviously it varies, right? What does accountability mean at each level? It can be, you know, compensation at an executive level. Um, it could be KPIs and metrics at, you know, a manager, frontline manager level. But I'm a believer that policies in place work. And I've seen that they make changes sometimes not in the best light, but they do work. Gotcha. That's a great perspective. I think it, it really is about execution, right? The idea and intent is good usually, but it's about how do we go about executing and actually um, enforcing it. So Rohan, did you have thoughts as well? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm similar about as Christina and Marjorie. I believe these things are the right thing to do. Mandate comp incentives. I think they are a solution to increasing diversity when a company reaches a certain size, at least when you're not just in kind of a talent grab mode and just trying to hire um, some sales engineers or some pre-sales resources at some point. But let's be honest, money talks and it does get the job done if you have incentives, monetary incentives in there. And the job being having a diverse workforce, having a diverse team with diversity of thought, which will help you problem solve a lot of different um, types of problems and will up-level the whole problem solving skill set of the team and ultimately contribute to a larger top line as well. So I, I do believe that these things are important to have in place when a company reaches a certain size. The elephant in the room is what Christina, what you were talking about, whether you should be choosing someone from an underrepresented population over for a job or a promotion or a raise over someone who is just as deserving. And I don't think there is a simple answer to that. I think every organization has to think about that themselves, but I think something to think about is that historically speaking, the underrepresented populations, those groups, whether it's by race or sex or socioeconomic background or religion or sexual preference, they have not had the same opportunities as others, especially when it comes to white collar, high paying jobs like tree sales, like sales engineers as well. And if we don't make a conscious effort to change that, it will, it'll continue. At least that's my perspective. I think if we think that things will just change and things will happen naturally and diversity will happen naturally, in my opinion, they'll continue to be how they are and we won't get that diversity in the workforce that we want. So if we do make that conscious effort with incentives, with mandates, with quotas, again, depending on the organization, we will get that intended outcome. So Again, long-winded way of saying that, yes, I do believe incentives for hiring and promoting um, uh, and including less represented populations do work and, and is needed. And, and yeah, I just want to uh, actually echo that. I think that's super important because there's two sides of it, like everyone's talking about. Like, I don't want to feel that I get a job just because of the way I look, right? I don't want to feel that way. I want to make sure that I'm getting a job because of who I am as a person and my ability to execute. So like, how do you balance that? And I think what you're mentioning is actually a great way to approach it. And another thing that I've noticed is seeing that diversity, not just on the front lines, but also within leadership goes a long way. Um, and having KPIs and, and things like that around having diversity at that level really does help because it, it does carry a lot of weight to see someone uh, or see a, a, a leadership team that embraces diversity and it's not just simply a policy, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a really, really strong point, Carl. Thanks for chiming in on that. Um, I do, we do have time for one last question. I do wanna make sure we have time for open Q&A from the audience. So if you do have a question, make sure you drop it into the Q&A box and we will pull some of those out in a few minutes here after we have this uh, um, or have our last planned question, which is, what can all of us do in the audience, in the community, you know, on the panel, everybody together, what can we do to be an ally? What are your thoughts on that, Carl? Um, yeah, just, I think, reaching out um, and, and being, being confident and, and, and feeling that, you know, people are going to accept you for who you are. And if you don't feel that way, talk about it, right? It's something that you can go and this is actually a unique time right now where even though we're isolated or, or under lockdown, I actually feel like I'm connecting with a lot of people individually a lot more just by setting up one-on-ones with people that I normally wouldn't really get the chance to talk to. Um, so one being who you are and being 
I don't want to say unapologetic about it, uh, but I will say being who you are is super important and bringing that to the team. And then being willing to ask why, ask, dig deeper into who someone is and really try to connect to that person. Um, I think that goes a long way just from my own um, experience, having people reach out to me and ask me questions and really try to get to know me makes me feel more comfortable to be who I am. So I think those two things go a, a long way. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, definitely being open-minded, curious, intentional. Marjorie, what about you? Yeah, I love that, Carl, that whole um, be curious. I, I did hear from a speaker once who said, though, you should ask for permission first. Don't just assume that someone's going to be comfortable just talking about themselves, right? So if you do have questions, like, hey, can I ask you this question? Um, I think it's great. And I think most folks who come from a minority background are happy to answer those questions, but some aren't. Um, so, you know, just be cognizant of that. I think the other thing is um, joining, you know, employee resource groups or ERGs for um, groups that are different than you. Um, you that's the only way you're going to learn, right, is if you go out and hear and listen about the experiences from other people. Here we have um, this reverse mentoring program that some of our leaders go through. And it's amazing to hear the stories that they hear and how they're like, we really didn't know that that's actually happened to women. And you know, so, again, you know, take advantage hear from others. So I think that's number one. The other one is um, always have an advocate on your board of people that are different than you, right? So um, for example, I, I say have your own board of people that you trust, that you reach out to, that you talk to, that you, you know, solicit input from. Make sure that they're, you know, of different backgrounds, whether it be, you know, um, racial or gender or any other category. Again, make sure that they're varied and diverse there. And then when you hear something that isn't aligned to your values, and you believe that it's not a positive one, either ask questions and you know, try to understand a little bit more. But if it is actually something that's bad, speak up, right? If you, if you don't speak up, no one else will. And um, you'll always find yourself that um, afterwards, people will get together and like, oh man, I really wish I had said something that wasn't cool when that person said that. Um, be the one that's brave and, and stand up for other people as well. Yeah, the the only thing I would add there is just, yeah, I've worked past 10 years or so at smaller companies. So a lot of times there aren't ERGs that are created already or there aren't a whole lot of different Slack channels or whatever it may be for people in different backgrounds to, to get together. I think the, the one thing I would say is, is get educated. If, and if you're so inclined, reach out, be proactive and reach out to your HR department and offer your help if this is something that interests you. Again, small companies often need someone to kickstart it. There's often someone in HR that's thinking about this, but they're just a small company and they don't have the bandwidth to do this. So having someone in the field that's interested in this, interested in championing this, interested in, in pioneering this will always help. Um, and your help could be something simpler. It could just be to, to have a session on biases. I know I've talked about biases a lot, but have a session on biases so people realize that there are these unconscious or subconscious biases, or maybe it's also just someone that's um, on the lookout for instances where there are people being excluded subconsciously, not on purpose, and how they can help people overcome those, those exclusions that happen as well. So again, small companies, it takes a little bit more activity it takes to someone to be a little bit more proactive and reach out to the HR department and say, hey, I'd like to help with this. So that would be my advice as well if you're like me at a smaller company. Thanks, Rohan. I would Chris, say, I mean, Chris. yeah, there's, I, 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 you know, there's very little I can add to that because I think, um, I think Carl, Marjorie, um, and Rohan are spot on. Um, I love it. The, the um, only thing that I, that I might add because Carl had talked about how um, if you don't you see yourself being represented, then make sure to to speak up and talk about it. And I think um, I would I would say as a leader, the other thing that I always think about is I want to ensure that I'm creating an environment where people feel comfortable that they can talk about it. And so as a leader, my my only add on to that is ensure that you create um, an environment where anyone can feel confident or comfortable that they can talk to someone about it, whether it's human, whether it's the um, uh, the human resource department, uh, you know, employee success, uh, the leadership team appear. That's the thing that I've always talked about is if you feel 
that you're not being represented or you feel uncomfortable or even with your direct leader, that's, that's okay. There might be, again, unconscious biases that, that are occurring. Um, it's really important to speak to someone because it's really, it's also as a leader, hard to, to, to fix or resolve um, anything that, that could be occurring if you aren't aware that these things are occurring, um, especially as a global leader, you know, I'm, I'm not always purview to what's going on in Singapore or in Dubai or in these, you know, in different um, parts of the country. Um, and so it just that's, that's one of the things that I just want to ensure that we're having that open uh, dialogue, dialogue. Just, and one other thing, uh, we talk about allies and it's interesting because I, when I think of allies, I'm always thinking of others who come from a diverse background, but we should also remember that there are a lot of allies that also come from, you know, Caucasian men out there who believe, who empathize and believe in it. And I'll tell you, I have a SE leader on my team who keeps me in check, which I love. I love and adore that because he's like, you know, there's questions when we're interviewing um, leaders like, well, what's our percentage of, uh, you know, women or minorities on the leadership team? And I'm looking at them like, it's amazing that you think of these, but it just, it's very front of mind for him, maybe because of what his background is. And so those allies just come from every walks of life. That would be my only other suggestion. That's great. Thanks, Christina. I appreciate all your perspectives on how to be an ally. Uh, it's, it's important to be open and to continue to talk about it, I think, more than anything, right? So really appreciate you guys' perspectives. Uh, we're getting close on time here before we get into Q&A. And so if you do have questions, please do keep funneling them into the Q&A chat. I uh, just want to quickly cover off the takeaways that we gathered from today's discussion. So first and foremost, diversity provides a competitive edge something that Christina mentioned throughout the discussion, and also become co conscious of your biases. I mean, Rohan covered kind of the three primary biases that we can potentially encounter unconsciously. And so do what you can to kind of think about those and talk about those so that they can become more conscious. And then Carl mentioned being intentional and purposeful towards inclusion, right? It's something that you actually have to go and, and, and be intentional about, uh, which is very important to do and something that I've been trying to do a lot more myself as well. And then lastly, Marjorie said, you know, be an advocate for inclusion. When you hear something that isn't aligned with values that you believe will drive inclusion, make sure you speak up and make sure you talk about it. Uh, that's important to do and, you know, and be courageous there. So with that, hopefully you got a lot out of the session today. What I do want to do is quickly take at least a couple questions with the t time we have here. Um, maybe we'll start with the question from Laura. What are the main initiatives you are driving on the ground as leaders to improve diversity? So you want to take that one? So one of the things that I had put down was, um, you know, make sure that I'm dedicating um, time on every staff call to something that's diversity inclusion related. So the first five to 10 minutes, um, we talk about, you know, whether it be hiring practices, um, or how our teams are feeling or what we're doing to make sure that the team feels included. So that's one aspect that's bringing visibility. Um, we're also creating an ambassador program of where I've asked each of the managers on my team to have a representative from each of their teams um, as part of this program. And they then go to this uh, enhanced DNI type training on a weekly basis. And then they come back and I'm asking them to bring it back to the team. Again, they continue to make sure that the team understands that it's top of mind and it needs to be top of mind at every level of the organization. And then similar to what Rohan and, and um, Christina mentioned earlier about from a hiring perspective, have at least one candidate that's you know, of a diverse background in, in the pool at a minimum, and then at a minimum one person in the panel that's part of the interview process um, is, is something that we practice as well. Yeah, and if I can add to that, Marjorie, I would just say that uh, in when, when there's teams within, the, um, within my organization, one of the things that we try to implement um, and we continue to implement is we ensure that we have um, skip levels across the organization. And they really, and they vary based on um, region, um, position, all across uh, the different aspects of uh, the different indi individuals in my organization. Because again, when, when the team gets so large, um, that's when you start either having the team feel like they're not being represented if they're a minority um, and just ensuring that there are skip levels that are occurring check-ins um, is the only thing I, I would add to that. 
last thing, we have a small organization here at Gong. So just um, every company has its own cadence of meetings, of company-wide meetings where things can be brought up and team meetings as well. So we have a company-wide lunch and learn every Tuesday from 12 to one, bring your lunch, come into the cafeteria. When we used to have a cafeteria that we used to be able to go into. Um, but there, there's always an opportunity to bring up a topic like this. There's a different topic that happens every week. Make sure that that's on some kind of regular cadence, one, whether it's once a quarter, or once every X number of weeks, or X number of months. So it's top of mind for people as well. So that's something that we've, we've tried to do as well. Thanks for sharing guys, appreciate that. Unfortunately, we're at a little out of time here and I do wanna wrap up with a few things to share with the community before we go. So uh, first of all, thank you so much to the panel. Thank you for joining us today and sharing your perspectives on diversity and inclusion. It's so important. And like I mentioned, we should continue to talk about it. So thank you so much, Christina, Marjorie, Carl from Way Down Under, thanks for getting up so early. And, and Rohan, thank you so much. Um, thank you for everything you did for this panel today, but also just the, the pre-sales community in general. Very, very uh, appreciative of you all. So we'll wrap with uh, this quick poll here. So we wanted to just know how we did, the, the way we get better and provide you, the, the collective, with more content that's valuable to you. Uh, we really want to get feedback. And we also want to know if you'll join us next week for the webinar that we're hosting with, the, with WISE, Women in Solution Excellence, on the topic of No Woman Left Behind. Let me quickly share a couple things to wrap up. So we were only able to get one question answered from the open Q and A, but we have a discussion form on the website. So we, what we did last week was we opened up a thread for the webinar topic. So we'll do the same this week. So we can continue the conversation. If you have any questions, I'll be monitoring the board. I know Carl's active on the boards too. So we'll, we'll be there to, to answer whatever questions you might have that come up. And just to quickly share some of the cool upcoming webinars we have, we have one webinar for every week in May. And so for next week, we have what I meant, we just mentioned, which is with the WISE panel. A lot of really, really amazing pre-sales leader women from DocuSign and, and Salesforce sharing their stories. And then we have Stephen Morris and Justin McManus, the second week in May, joining us to talk about integrating a holistic approach towards becoming a best-in-class sales engineer. Stephen Morris has been a lifelong, almost feels like, a uh, pre-sales leader. He, he was at Salesforce in the early days to help build out the pre-sales team. And so it, he has a lot to share from his experience. And then the second half of May, we have Zach and Jesse, who are joining us from Slack and People AI to talk about value selling and you know being more than just a product expert, right? Which is something we all try to do as sales engineers or pre-sales folks. And then to round out May, this is the one I'm really excited about is growing and scaling pre-sales and hyper growth. We have three leaders who have built pre-sales teams and hyper growth at, from Snowflake, from uh, Kathy who was actually did it at ServiceNow and then Thomas from Okta. And to give you an example, Steve built the pre-sales team from zero to 170 SCs at Snowflake. So quite an incredible story that you'll want to tune in and, and hear more about. Uh, and I think that's that's all I have to share. So, oh, oh, sorry, the newsletter too. You should have the newsletter. If you're not set up for, for the newsletter, make sure you go to the website and sign up. You'll get the newsletter that kind of gives you a recap and also a looking forward of what's to come. So thanks Hannah Bloking for, for putting the newsletter together for us. And with that, just about on time, thanks again so much to the panel for, for all the effort you guys put into preparing for this and also you know, sharing your, your thoughts on diversity and inclusion, very important topic. Thank you to all the attendees from around the globe who tuned in early, late, or in the middle of the day. Uh, and then, yeah, I just wanna say have a great rest of your day, great rest of your week, and we will see you next week. Bye everyone. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Bye. Cheers. Thanks, Eugene. Bye guys.